Hello, and welcome to our second Q&A session of our Wonder Kids Ask a Developmental Psychologist series. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Portia Quivi, and I'm the recruitment coordinator for the Early Development Research Group at UBC. Dr. Walker, along with her amazing team of trainees at the Infant Studies Center, studies language acquisition and speech perception in infants. The Infant Studies Center is one of seven research centers that make up the early development research group. Because most of the research done by Janet and her team took place on campus at the University of British Columbia, I would like to acknowledge that our campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and senior territory of the Moschian people. But of course, this is a virtual event. And so I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the many lands you may be joining from both near and far. I will introduce Janet in just a moment and then open the floor to questions, taking us to about nine o'clock. Together, your questions will be using the Q&A window that you may access at the, um, at the bottom of your screen, um, along the bottom of the screen of your Zoom window, sorry. Um, we'll be going through the questions on a first come first serve basis, beginning with the questions that got submitted ahead of time through our RSVP form. Please do feel free to pop in and out as you need. We understand that most of you have little ones at home. If you're unable to stay for the entire session or have technical issues, don't worry. And we will be posting a recording of the session on the EDRG website. As mentioned, Janet specializes in language development, but has knowledge in other areas of child development. If you have questions in these areas, she will, Janet will be happy to answer them. But we will also be hosting events um, with, that will cover these topics as well. So feel free to join in on those as well. I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Janet Weicker today. She is University Killam Professor and Canada Research Chair in Psychology and has been conducting groundbreaking developmental research at UBC since 1985. She is the first to discover just how early language learning begins in infancy and has transformed the field of developmental psychology with her work. Among her numerous accomplishments and prestigious awards, Janet is an officer of the Order of Canada, is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and has won a Killam Prize and an SSHRC Gold Medal. However, the impact of Janet's research on families like yours is really one of the most exciting aspects of her work at the Infant Study Center. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Janet Wecker. Thank you so much, Janet, for joining us today. And I will jump in into some Martin. of the questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I guess we've begun so we can move that slide forward. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first question we have is, how do babies differentiate between two languages when parents are speaking these different languages? Right. That's a really important and really interesting question. And it's one that we've been studying for many years, as have other people in the world. Um, and what we've found is that babies are very sensitive to the differences in one language versus another. They pay attention to the melody of each one language versus another, the rhythm, the individual speech sounds, of course, and the words. But, it's, but let, let me give you a little bit more detail about how they separate their languages. So what we've found is that actually, surprisingly, already at birth, newborn babies who have been exposed to two languages throughout gestation, you know, because some of that the mother is speaking, because um, some of that is some of language gets across the uterine wall, also through bone conduction. Um, it's even clearer, and the rhythm is correlated with the mother's breathing, and that, of course, um, uh, the fetus experiences. And what we've found is that even at birth, babies show preference for listening to the language they heard in utero. Babies who were, grown, who were exposed to two languages in utero show preference for those two languages, so they'll suck on a pacifier to hear a familiar language, even as newborns, like four hours after birth, we've tested them. Um, 
So they show a preference for both of the languages they heard in utero over an unfamiliar language, but they also can discriminate them even as newborns. Um, so we think that's quite remarkable. And then as they age, they by four months, they can discriminate one of their two languages from the other on the basis of just the rhythm alone. By the time they're six months, they're using the melody. You hear how my voice goes up and down. Uh -huh. Rhythmically, English is sort of like da, 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 da. Some other languages like French is more like da, 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 da. Japanese is more like da, 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 <laughs> um, and so babies use rhythm, they use the melody, um, they use the speech sounds of the languages. Um, so um, in English, um, we have like raw, law, those are not in some other languages. And so babies will know when you're speaking that language that it's possibly one language and not the other one. Of course, they don't know this is English and this is Japanese, just they, they keep them apart. Um, they use so many of the cues. And what's really interesting as well is they also can discriminate languages, but just by watching silent talking faces. So we showed them videos of bilingual speakers um, reading some um, stories um, from a storybook, and then we turned off the sound. And we showed them you know, through people speaking in one language over and over again, you know, without any sound till the babies got bored. And then we switched the language, the same speakers, and babies recovered their interest. So, mm -hmm. it's, so they can use even the cues in silent talking faces. All babies do this at four and six months. By eight months, monolingual babies can't do it anymore, but bilingual babies are still tracking this information. So they also use faces, yeah, to discriminate one language from another, um, even in the same speaker. So it's pretty amazing. And what we think this does is it allows them to track the properties and learn the words um, and grammatical structure of each of their languages simultaneously. That's very fascinating. These like little subtle things and babies are able to keep track of them. It's really, it's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Um, similar to this question is, are there any developmental changes in bilingual um, children? For example, um, delays in use of either language or is there um, a hesitant to speak? Um, and how do they learn to distinguish the two languages? And is it helpful to talk to them about the different languages or just simply expose it to them? I can repeat any part of the question if you'd like. Right, um, so that's a big question with a lot it's a of- big question, yeah. <laughs> um, So I think we talked a little bit about discriminating their languages. And of course, once they know a little bit more, it, it, each everything they learn, they can build on. So as they learn more words, they have more information about which language is being spoken. Um, uh, um, they also, they across the board, bilingual children, infants and children achieve the milestones in language acquisition at about the same age as do monolingual learning infants. So they're not faster, they're not slower. There's an enormous amount of individual variation in language acquisition. And one of the things that happens when a baby is growing up with more than one language in the home is if they're slower at language acquisition, then the child next door, then their mom or dad or doctor or aunt and uncle might worry that they're delayed because of growing up bilingual, but it's they're not. It's the same variation that you see in, in the normal population. So being bilingual does not delay acquisition. Um, there are some things that they may be a little bit different on. Um, so the number of words learned in each language is lower in a bilingual child because they're getting only half as much input in each language, let's say but the total conceptual vocabulary as we call it. So the total number of, of things 
thoughts, ideas, objects in the world that they have words for is at least as big, and in many studies, bigger um, for yeah. same aged bilingual learning toddlers and young children as it is for monolingual. Uh, but they might not have as many words in each individual language. Um, did I get to all the parts of that question? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you did. I think just another, another one was, um, is it just exposing them to the languages or are there specific, right. you know, ways to do it? Right. So I think one of the questions that's often asked there is, um, and maybe this is going to come up as another question, is um, whether each parent should speak a different language. So do they need one parent, one language in order to keep the languages apart and acquire them? Or is it okay to just do whatever you do? Mm -hmm. And it, it appears that it's okay to do just whatever you do. Uh, there are homes in which people are more comfortable with one parent, one language. So if that's what they're comfortable with in the home, that's fine. Uh, a child can learn to be bilingual that way. Uh, but if, if both parents or, or everybody who's living in the home is bilingual and are using or switching back and forth between their languages, and that's the environment that the child grows up in, they can learn that as well. And they don't even get confused by the sort of like language mixing that happens if you're a fully bilingual person talking to another fully bilingual person in the same two languages, you might like mix words, you might switch from one sentence to the next and then back again, or one topic to the next. And mm -hmm. babies who are growing up bilingual manage that as well. Oh, wow. That's yeah. That's incredible. It <laughs> is incredible. Keep track of that. Yeah, that's very incredible. incredible. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, so there is a, a chat there. Oh, yes, there is. It's about. Um, the, oh, like even language, yeah, um, so specifically the question was about if it helps and talk to the children about the languages and even, la even label them sort of like metacognitive discussions. Um, when they get older, it is, and they like it a lot. When they're infants, of course, it isn't helpful. But a six-year-old might be super interested in hearing, oh, now you're talking French. Oh, now you're talking English. Even a four-year-old or a three-year-old, um, a, 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 a sophisticated three-year-old. Uh, but an infant, of course, that isn't helpful for. Um, but a three or four-year-old might love to play a game with, you know, you know what is shoe in your other language um, or something like that. It's not necessary, um, but it's something that they could quite enjoy. Sorry, Portia. No worries. Thank you, Dana, for you know um, correcting how I you know said your question. Yeah. So if at any point in time I misinterpret anyone's question, please feel free to you know send a message in the chat. Um, so another question is please because it's specific to monolingual um, families, and it's. Um, you know, what are good ways to expose children to learning new languages? I guess it's still pretty similar. And the question is like, would watching TV shows in other languages with subtitles have any impact in monolingual families? That's really interesting. Um, so um, first of all, although, you know, it's really wonderful if you have two languages or more in the home and you can give a child an opportunity to be exposed to both of them and to learn both of them, that's a real gift. If you don't have two languages in the home, there are probably other, you know, kinds of enrichment that you're providing. So I, I would never say that it's essential that a child be exposed to more than one language early on. Um, it's it's just something that if you have, that's part of your home, that's wonderful. Now, if you want your child to have the opportunity to learn another language, um, there are a lot of different things you can do. Um, so, um, you know, you can enroll them in little preschool classes that have another language. It might not stick much, but it might, it might have an impact on their attitude toward language learning, which is, which will then situate them to you know, be more um, effective at language learning when they get a little bit older. Um, sitting them in front of a TV, um, it, it's not as effective when they're young. Um, 
children learn language um, through sort of contingent interactions. They don't learn it just from having it spoken at them or listening um, to it. It's when you're interacting with each other. So language is to communicate. Um, and so, you know, if a child's interest, you hold something up and they're interested in it, you enable it or talk about it. Oh, look, there's a red pin. Most pins aren't red. I wonder what's different about a red pin or something like that. You elaborate, they, and then as a function of the child's interest, that's when they learn language best. The most research on, um, uh, so I, I'll leave that aside, but um, they don't just learn, they, they won't learn another language just by being placed in front of the TV. If you're with them and you're trying to learn that language as well, and let's say that it's a children's show or part of Sesame Street where you know, they introduce different languages sometimes, just little bits of them. If you're interacting with the TV, with the child, then they can learn from it. Um, and then as they get older, if they want to try to learn from it, um, they can. But I think there are a lot more effective um, online um, um, interfaces and games and that um, can, again, have that contingent turn taking to help teach language um, than just watching TV and just using the subtitles. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and I guess similar to this is, you know, when you're talking about being more interactive, the question is, is would flashcards and storytelling be more beneficial in teaching language? Right. Um, and I think storytelling is very beneficial. Um, as they get older, children like, you know, if they, if they like flashcards and they want to learn specific words or something, then that can be effective. Um, you know, when they're really little, if it's a game, it's probably good. I mean, there are resources like one resource that um, has been created by um, uh, Professor Bonnie Norton in the, the School of Education at UBC is called Storybooks Canada. And there's also Indigenous storybooks. She started it with African storybooks. Um, and it's, it's children's stories that are written and spoken in a language, and then you can push buttons um, to have that story delivered, um, spoken or written in any of several other languages. And so that's, and it's a freely available resource and it's called Storybooks Canada. If you go to Storybooks Canada, you can get to all the other sites. She also has an indigenous storybooks now. Um, so that's, that's, one kind of yeah. fun um, interactive game, yeah. yeah, yeah. That sounds that sounds something like I would even want to do. <laughs> it's yeah, funny. it's really cool. Yeah. Um, on the topic of schools and daycare, one question is: How do you combat the inevitable taking over of community language as kids mm -hmm. enter day daycare uh, or school, and tips to preserve the minority language spoken at home? That's really, really difficult question. Um, it's, it's even the children of psycholinguists um, stop using their home language, their heritage language when they start even daycare. They oh. wanna use the, the, the language that's dominant um, in the society. Um, one of my colleagues was telling me today that, that her five-year-old who's now in kindergarten came home and said, mommy, her, her husband's, my, my friend is from Canada, her husband, uh, English Canada, her husband's from Mexico, they speak Spanish and English at home. And Elia came home the other day and said, mommy, Spanish isn't good. Um, and it's just, you know, so horrible. And it's a, it's a really big challenge. Um, and there is no guarantee um, sort of approach for success. But the kinds of things that work are, are that can be effective are, you know, making it fun, not requiring a child to do something because they never do what you require them to do. Uh, making it fun. One way to make it fun is to get together with other families who speak um, that other heritage language, 
have, you know, celebrations, parties, food around the other language, so where their children speak it as well. If there's a little bit older child that a young child looks up to who will model using that language, those are those are things that can be effective. Mm -hmm. um, going back, if there's a country to go back to um, and you can get there and it's not COVID, um, you know, immersing the child in seeing that this language lives in this culture is, uh, is effective, but it's a real challenge. The, the only, I think, saving grace is that the language is in there. And even if it, it, they still understand it at home, even if they refuse to use it. Um, and they have the capacity to relearn more rapidly and more easily when they get older, um, given that early exposure. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I'm hoping with the greater sensitization in society to you know, the value of different cultures that that will eventually seep down to the, the daycare and preschool and kindergarten mm -hmm. um, um, society. But yeah, that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it sounds very, sounds like such a difficult thing to navigate as like, you know, a family. Um, mm -hmm. We have, we have a question that's talking about sign language and it's, um, how can sign language help children acquire language skills? That's a wonderful question. So I guess there are two parts to the answer. Um, so the first part is, if a child is born deaf, and um, the, the family is one in which, let's say there's hereditary deafness. So the parents are signers. Um, that's the first language in the home. And um, it's a full language. Um, it's, you know, there people are fluent, if they're fluent signers, um, uh, that can be the first language of, of, a, of a, a child with a hearing impairment. And that family may or may not decide to, to do um, like hearing aids or cochlear implants because they might want their child to have sign as their first and primary language. Um, children who grow up with sign can also be bilingual. They can be bimodal bilinguals. Um, so they can have sign and a spoken language if they're hearing um, and um, or get some hearing augmentation. And they can, um, so that's, um, so it's, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. I think perhaps the question that this person was asking was more about baby sign and whether baby sign is effective. Um, and so baby sign is not a full language. It's yeah. like having some words, um, um, seldom even any small constructions. Um, so it's e giving a baby baby sign is equivalent to teaching them however many words, 15, 25, that one has signs for. Um, and um, uh, it's not giving them a language. So that's number one. But number two is babies like it. And it can be easier to produce some of the, the signs like more than it is to say the word more. And it can decrease frustration on the part of the child and increase the communicative effectiveness between the parent and the child. And it's something you're doing with your child. You're spending time with them. You're showing you care. Um, you're giving them these signs that, as I said, can be easier to produce than words. It takes a lot of neuromuscular control to produce a word. It it's, takes a lot for a sign too, but it's not as hard. Um, and so it's great. There's no good evidence. The meta-analyses indicate that babies who acquire, who are given baby sign actually don't have a leg up on language acquisition, but they do have a leg up on reducing frustration if they were frustrated at not being able to speak. And as I said, it has all these other possible benefits that are positive. There can be other ways to get there. Um, so that's not what people like to hear about with baby sign. So feel free to push back. Um, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's still, it shows you care. It's like drawing with a child. They're not necessarily going to become an artist, but it's something you do together. And, and it's lovely. Um, 
I think there's a follow up question in the chat um, and it's do kids who have sign language also show collective monologue? I don't know what collective monologue is. So maybe um, the person can the define best. it. For yeah, me. maybe. Um, maybe we can. Oh. Like turn taking. Oh, they absolutely show turn taking. There's turn taking in sign language, just like there is in a spoken language. And with baby sign, there is turn taking. And there's also something called home sign. I don't know if you've heard about this. And this is babies who um, um, are hard of hearing, or they're not able to hear, and they grow up in a home where um, there's only spoken language and they can't get it in. Um, they will make up a language. I mean, so they'll start making signs and even parents who want their child to acquire a spoken language, so they're afraid to sign to them, um, they start doing these home signs as well. And the thing about home sign that's really interesting is it's, it's, um, it's not a full language, but it has a lot of the properties that will become a language eventually. And so, um, you know, there are different different words for different items. There are uh, constructions that are created to show that something is like moving uh, from here to somewhere else to refer to uh, something in the world or something that isn't here right now. It has a grammar to it, a particular grammar. And the work, uh, uh, there have been studies like with the Nicaraguan sign language is the most um, famous where deaf children who had developed these home signs were all brought together and over a couple of cohorts of children. So over about six years with new kids coming in, they developed their own sign language and it was a full language. So that was really cool. So yes, they can do all of those things. Um, does it have changes in their brain cortex? Absolutely. So children who um, sign from birth, who cannot hear, and um, actually sign is not only in the visual cortex, it, and even if they can hear, but it's more if they can't hear, it also ends up activating the language areas in the, the temporal lobes, like here in the auditory cortex. And so what it looks like, this suggests is that the auditory cortex is specialized for language. It prefers auditory input, but if it can't get auditory input, it takes visual language input and uses the same areas. And so then the pathways become stronger. Does it interfere with later spoken language acquisition? There's still debate about that, but it looks like it doesn't. It looks like there's plenty of cortex to do both. Um, and yes, um, and yes, using their hands, the, the representation of space is more precise in people who sign um because a lot of the signs I, I can't sign so what i'm doing is confusing to anybody out there who can sign um <laughs> but people who can sign um so there are signs it's hand shape um um position and kind of form of movement are the three basic um facets of a sign and um so yes spatial um there are differences in the way space is represented. It's re represented more precisely in signers. Um, yeah. And as I said, um, each, whatever language or languages you grow up with, I mean, the brain does language and it does language in pretty much the same way, no matter what language you learn. But of course there are overlaying that basic pattern of similarity. So, you know, hearing and producing, actually they're the other way, and the connections, the articulus that connects them, it's also connected to the visual areas, it's also connected to everything you know. So there, there's 
there's that, but there over and above that, there of course are differences as a function of what language it is you learn, what languages it is you learn. Um, and if you're learning more than one language, it even affects the attentional systems in the brain. So whatever language, whatever environment you grow in, up in, of course does sculpt the brain a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. there was a question that we, we moved over. Miss, oh yeah, in the chat. Thank you so much, Anna. Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, I'm pregnant and my first language is Farsi. Um, how can we practice with a baby now so that um, she'd be able to learn English um, language as well? Oh, she'll be able to learn English language as well. I wouldn't worry about it. If you're speaking Farsi now, she might show preference for Farsi at birth, but it's a preference that is there's still so much flexibility in the brain at that age. It's not going to have any impact. Um, if, if you only, well, you don't just speak Farsi at home. I see the way you're writing. Um, you're writing beautiful English. So you probably use um, both English and Farsi. Um, giving a child a heritage language or a language from someplace else does not interfere with their ability to learn English um, at the same time or a little bit later. Um, if they don't get any English input till they're like six or eight years old, then it's going to be harder than if they start going to that terrible preschool or daycare that's going to make them stop using their first language. <laughs> but they're going to learn English very easily. Mm. Thanks, Janet. There's another question in the chat, um, but before I get to that question, there's been a question in the Q&A box, so I'm just going to read that one out, mm -hmm. and it's, um, does monologue conversations differ between bilingual kids? Um, yeah. So what, can you read that again? Does monolingual conversations differ between bilingual kids? Oh, interesting. Um, so um, if one of the things that children who are growing up bilingual do as early as two and a half is they use the language in the way the people around them are using the language. So um, it's hard to see in a two and a half year old because they don't talk that much yet. But in a three or a four year old, you can easily see them. If one person in the room is speaking, let's say are they're English, French bilinguals. If one person in the room is speaking in English, they'll talk to that person in English. And somebody else starts speaking in French, they'll talk to that person in French. If those two people are code switching, as I said, then the three-year-old or four-year-old will also code switch. And the amount of code switching, so like saying, um, Oh, look at that cute little shin running down the street. You know, the dog can't speak well. Um, <laughs> the, child, the amount of code switching in a child is equivalent to in their environment. If they're not used to code switching and they're talking to somebody who's code switching, they won't do it and they might get confused. When they talk to each other, the same thing happens. So mm -hmm. if two bilingual children are bilingual in the same two languages, they will probably switch back and forth unless they're in a setting like a school where the, they're probably more likely to use the dominant language. Um, but if they are families or friends and they get together and use the other language, they might do that with each other at school as well. And if they're talking in both languages or the other language, they're, they're talking in both languages, they'll do the same amount of code switching that they experience in their home environments. If two children are bilingual, but not the same languages, so one is English French and um, one is English Tagalog, they're going to talk to each other in English. Um, and so they might try, if they're really little, they might try one of those other languages, like what language do you speak? And then when they find the common language, it's not that um, they're going to um, use languages that are not understandable. Um, I mean, they might try, but they will, if they have a language that fits that environment, they will switch to it. I find it very interesting that they kind of imitate the environment without, you know, being told to do it. I think that's very, yeah. very yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yes. And they, they pick um, up even more than that. I'm just going to just say one more thing. <laughs> 
um, I, I had a, a research associate in the lab um, for several years who had, she's very blonde, and but they had spent 10 years in Japan. And so her two younger, very blonde daughters grew, grew up with Japanese and English. And we had a Japanese English family come into the lab one day and the baby was only, well, they were about 18 months old. And one of the daughters was visiting and she started speaking Japanese to the family. And the child was like, whoa, why is this person <laughs> speaking Japanese? So they also, they know other characteristics that go through languages. Okay. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. Um, so the question in the chat is, um, will the use of face coverings due to the pandemic have some effects on how children acquire language? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we all worry about this. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, thankfully you don't have to wear your face covering at home. So when you're interacting with your own child and in your family setting, people are not wearing face masks. And um, it's also, um, there have been, there are lots of cultures around the world where part of the face is covered uh, much of the time. So um, in a lot of Asian countries, whenever anybody starts to get a cold, they've been putting a face mask on for years. We used to poo poo that. Now we realize how smart that was. Um, there are, um, um, Muslim cultures where, you know, covering the face is important um, outside of the home. Again, it's not covered in the home or when you're in the presence of other, just other women. Um, and so it isn't, it isn't that unique to have children, babies growing up in a time like now, where when you go out into a public setting, people are covering their faces. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research going on, nonetheless, though, on, you know, does it muffle speech? Yes, it muffles speech. Does it make it incomprehensible? Probably not. And right. probably babies are listening more carefully um, and may become better able to understand a muffled signal as mm. you know, teenagers and adults than they would have without this experience at, that, at this age. Does it, 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 it covers, you know, the, the mouth movements. And we know that babies do use mouth movements to help them understand speech, just like you do. If you're at a noisy party, you're know, watching somebody's face, you're know, watching them talk helps. But you'll find that when you're listening to somebody right now, talking through a mask and it's muffled, if you watch their face, you can still understand better. And that's mm -hmm. because, the, the muscles that um, control like the lips and the jaw um, and even the tongue, but particularly the lips and the jaw are quite distributed. And so there is actually movement up here above the mask that is informative about articulatory movements. And there's a lot of information in your neck about pitch, believe it or not, and about um, voicing. So things like whether something is the word bat or pat, there's bat or pat, there's actually information in the neck. And we all use this information and we don't know we're using it. So babies are still having access to this. Um, and so there are more and more studies being published on this now. Um, I guess there's a special issue coming out called Under the Mask. Um, of, uh, I think it's maybe uh, infant behavior and development. Um, and one of the early findings that I have to see if it replicates, but it's replicating with adults as well, is that the transparent masks are actually worse than the cloth and paper masks, that they actually oh. distort the visual information a little bit. Uh, so, like, I, you know, who yeah. knows? I'm sure they, yeah, uh, I'm sure they can make them that. out of different materials, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that's really interesting. Um, 
And it, it, it is the case that like if in school, if you're trying to teach a child um, uh, the sounds of letters, it's hard not, you know, with the mask, but what mm -hmm. some teachers are doing is they actually make a video of themselves and they show it in the classroom while they're doing that with a mask on. So, um, oh, that's nice. yeah, yeah. So it probably, yes, will have some effects on how children acquire language, but they're getting the full signal at home. And they're probably, the younger they are, the more adaptable they are. We're all getting better um, <laughs> yeah. at processing speech through masks. And again, there's research on all of this. So. Probably, and it's probably not, as I said, as unique as we think it is. It's just unique here um, at this point in history. Yeah. Wow. Well, I would not have thought that the vision, the like transparency mask would be worse off. You think it would be better. I know. But I, know. Yeah. I know. So we'll <laughs> see, you know, if that replicates when I'm sure they can change the material. So what it was doing is like just just distorting it bends the light a little bit and that's oh. enough to make the signal unpredictable in a way that muffling doesn't so yeah. wow very fascinating <laughs> yeah um so we have another question about um so it's i have two daughters aged eight and a half and three and a half we live in iran I'm going to start my PhD program at UBC in fall 2022. Congratulations if you're here. Yeah. Um, and, and I am really worried about their communication skills because they can't speak English. What can I do within this nine month period? And so how old are the children again? Eight and a half and three and a half. Eight and a half and three and a half. Okay, yeah, the three and a half year old isn't going to have any difficulties. Um, it will take the eight and a half year old or nine year old a while. And it is a while. Um, and so um, it can take, um, yeah, it can take two to three years to catch up in school or even a little bit longer if you come in not knowing when you're that, the older you are, the longer it takes. Um, I think you can, if, um, if you speak English, you can start using English at home. Um, you can, you know, as a family, um, there are some very good online resources. Um, you could just start with Storybook Canada, but there are some other language teaching ones. If you if you have access to to classes for the child, the older child, you could do that. To the extent that you as a parent are involved, the child is going to be uh, more committed and learn more. It won't just feel like after school, um, something I have to do. Um, so you wanna make it a, a family activity. Uh, I know that's hard to find time to do. Um, so just as much as possible. Um, as I said, there are some good online games. I can, um, some are good, some are not good. So I can, uh, do a little bit of research and get back to you with that. But if you are able to speak English and you just start using English um, at home, um, that can really help. And the fact that you'll have um, an Iranian accent isn't a big deal because that will, A, first of all, Canada doesn't care. Um, and secondly, um, that, that will, as, as your child is exposed to more English speakers, that will moderate. Um, yeah, but with the older child, I would try to get some English in in this next nine months. Um, and they will learn and they will learn quickly as well, but not as quickly as the, the child who will be just a little bit four, over, over four when you come. And um, they will be frustrated a little bit when they're trying to learn in school. So maybe you can, they're old enough to talk to them about that and to let them know that, hey, you know, I'm having a hard time too. I'm used to, I'm not used to uh, studying in English, if that's the case, although you probably are. Um, and uh, you're smart, you're 
great kid, you know, we'll get through this and just stay there and to be supportive, work with the teachers. Yeah. Um, we have, I think we have maybe time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, so I might prioritize the questions that come in the chat or in the QA box. Um, but in the meantime, we have a question that is my 18 month son, 18 month son hasn't spoken any word. Um, we speak both Mandarin and English at home. What should we do to help him? Right. Well, first of all, it's not because you speak Mandarin and English. Second, he is a boy and boys are slower. Um, so my question would be, is he babbling? Um, so is he vocalizing? Is he doing turn taking? Um, and so is he showing an interest in communicating? Um, and then you can build on that. Um, if the other thing I've learned though, and so with little boys, as I said, it's, it's very, it's more difficult to determine whether something is just slow language development because little boys, there's a lot more variability. Um, girls are ahead in across the board, not any individual girl. Um, um, and so with little boys, uh, with eight, at 18 months with a little girl, I would be very worried. With a little boy, I wouldn't be as worried if, if he's vocalizing, if he's doing shared eye gaze, if he's, um, if he's trying to show you things, if he's responding when you show him things. But the other thing I've learned over the years is that if a parent is concerned, um, there may be something to be worried about. And right. so um, if somebody, Pat, if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, no, 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 everything's fine. If you're still concerned, um, you know, definitely, um, start um, trying to do everything you can, um, call your health authority, get on the wait list for intervention. There will be a wait list, um, but you might as well get on the wait list. You can always take your name off later. Um, the book that Portia had up at the beginning, um, the ABCs of language development is about language development in general in kids. Um, but and it's basically the first three years, I love it. I think it's an amazing book. I'm not an author. I did write the foreword. Um, but it also and it, it's a, it, it gives you the science and it gives you things that you can do um, to help with various things. And it's so readable. You don't have to read it from cover to cover. It's the ABCs. And so um, um, I can't even remember an example right now, but each letter, you can just go to any letter that you feel like, or you can look up in the glossary, um, uh, maybe C's for communication, I don't remember. And then you go there and it gives you the science and it gives you things that you can do to promote that. And there's also um, in it um, tips for language delay. And there's a companion document that's on the web that, again, if you contact Portia, we can send you the link for that's just about language delay and um, how to facilitate development while you're waiting, um, while you're doing everything, you know, maybe, maybe there's nothing to worry about. But if you are worried, get yourself on a waiting list and start doing, um, following some of those um, uh, suggestions in that. Thank you so much, Janet. I think we have room for one more question. Um, and that is, um, sorry, I just lost myself here. Um, my daughter is in grade one and she's starting to read and write in French. She speaks English and Spanish at home. She's doing well, but we are wondering if we should let her just do French first. Often we spell things for her in either English or Spanish. We don't want to confuse her. Right, right. I, I don't know as much about the research on immersion. Um, I do know that you're no different than most other families. That if she wants to know how to spell something and you don't know French, you're going to tell her how to spell it in English or Spanish. Um, and that, that's going to be the experience of many children in, in French immersion. Um, and um, I, I can, I'm sure the French immersion teachers tell you not to do that, that it is going to confuse them. Um, 
What happens though, is you want your child to love reading. It's wonderful that they're doing well. Come summertime, you're gonna to try to continue to get them booked in French and maybe they'll continue reading in French, but they're gonna, if they're readers, they're gonna slip into reading in English as well. And um, I don't know the research on the outcome of that, but I suspect they find their way, um, but I, I don't know. So I shouldn't um, say any more, but I can promise you every family, many families do exactly what you do. And the children, you know, eventually make the transition and they just make it a little earlier on their own, probably with in this kind of situation. Great. Thank you so much, Janet, for providing some insight into the fascinating world of language development. Um, there's a there's currently you know a very interesting study happening in Dr. Worker's lab that I want to share a little bit about. Um, during the first year of life, infants are rapidly learning um, their primary language or languages. And previous research suggests that children may be using different aspects of culture as cues in this process of learning a language. And for the bilingual speaker, um, in keeping these two languages apart. And so researchers at the Infant Study Center are looking to see whether cultural cues like music will have an effect on infants' ability to differentiate between language-specific speech sounds. Um, so if you have a 10 month old at home hearing Cantonese or Mandarin or even just English alone, you can participate in this really fun study. Um, you can scan the QR code on the slide to learn more about the study or to sign up. Um, the link will also be put in the chat shortly. Um, so you can also email me if ever you need a reminder on um, the link for this. Um, another thing I also want to share with you is a very interesting book that Janet brought up um, when she was answering some of the questions. And this book is written for parents, caregivers, educators, and anyone who supports families and children. It's the ABCs of language development, and it provides cutting edge research findings and how to practical strategies to support the communication and language development of all children organized in an ABC format. So by using the ABC formats, each letter illustrates what is typical for different stages of development, which allows a caregiver to see whether the child they interact with is meeting developmental milestones or not. Um, and the teachers in this book enable anybody to support the language development of the child they interact with. It provides a comprehensive approach to language development that includes um, and seamlessly integrates science, practical strategies, pre-literacy skills and social and emotional development for pre-verbal, verbal and non-verbal communication. So things like gestures or signing, like what we you know, discussed during this you know, Q&A session. Um, so there are some great questions that came up about how to support language skills in your infants. And this book could be a really good resource. So if you're interested in ordering the ABCs of language development, you can simply scan the QR code on this, on this slide. Um, and the book is also offered at a discounted rate for nonprofits. And so if you know an organization that might benefit from the book, please email the addresses included um, in the, on the slide as well. And for more information about the book, you can visit the link displayed on your slide. I will send all the links in the thank you email I will send at the end of this session. So no worries about not having it here. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today um, and for all the very interesting questions that came up. I'd like to use this moment to thank all the families that have participated in some of the research being done at the EDRG, including those being done by Dr. Um, Worker and her team. Our research is only possible because of families like yours, and now more than ever, we need families to help us expand our understanding of child development. If you're interested in participating with us, you can use the QR code displayed on your screen or the um, link that will be sent in the email afterwards after this event. Um, and we will reach out to you whenever there's a study that you and your little one might be eligible for. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I hope to see you at the next Q&A session with Dr. Sue Susan Birch. Thank you all so much and have a good rest of the evening. And thank you, Portia, for being such a wonderful <laughs> moderator. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>